Hello and welcome to the VAR video. I'm Siddharth Bhatia. We have with us today Dr. Bruno Massage, politician and author. He was the Europe Minister of Portugal from 2013 to 2015 and is now a non-resident senior fellow at Hudson Institute and also a senior advisor at Flint Global in London. Makayesh has written three books and his last one, History Has Begun, The Birth of New America, has been praised for its cultural analysis of the United States. His recent article in the New York Times, How Trump Almost Broke the Bounds of Reality, argues that the disconnect from reality that President Trump is accused of is a basic feature of the man and his style, not a flaw. So thank you for joining us, uh, Bruno Massage. It's a pleasure. Wonderful to be here. Okay. So the world is watching somewhat aghast as a simple election in the U.S. has turned into such a prolonged drama and it's bordering on farce, actually. How would you characterize what is happening there? Well, it is a, it is a drama. I think that's the best word. There's a strong element of spectacle, as I discuss in my book. Um, I don't think this is perhaps more controversial and polemical. I don't think it's it's down to Trump. I don't think this, these elements will disappear. In fact, we've seen them happen also in the last election. You remember that the Democrats also created a fantastical narrative, a full conspiracy theory around the idea that Russia had decided the election, uh, which was never really uh, supported by any evidence that I've seen. And I kept an open mind for two or three years. But I think we can now say that it's, it had the, all the essential elements of a conspiracy theory. Uh, and now we have, of course, as, as expected, I don't think that surprised anyone that Trump uh, is, um, is also creating enormous disruption. He cannot accept defeat. Um, I think he's looking for a way out and perhaps to prepare his candidacy in 2024. But for the time being, it's been, it's been disruptive. It's been chaotic. Um, and of course, not projecting the best image of American democracy. Although, on the other hand, uh, you do have to recognize that American institutions uh, have been put under the kind of strain that in many other countries they would not have resisted. Uh, I think this element of drama and spectacle has to be taken into account. Uh, uh, what seems to me to happen these days in America is that everything has to be put in quotes. This is not a coup. This is a coup in quotes. Uh, it was not uh, Russian collusion, it was Russian collusion in quotes, and so on and so forth. The element of show, of spectacle, seems to me dominant. And that also explains why the institutions can resist, um, because there's always a certain distance from, from, from reality. That feeds into the idea of American exceptionalism, because when you say it's put in quotes, it's like it's unprecedented. These things don't happen in our country. It's some, um, you know, middle Africa kind of uh, nation or something in Latin America. So this thing that our system is actually perfectly run in normal times, and this is some kind of aberration. So is that part of the myth making? I say in my book that when you look at America today, um, we see a country that in many respects has a lot in common with a developing country, uh, but in, in an ironic way, in a distance way. Um, I think um, what we see in America is, you know, let me make a comparison. Sometimes it may look like uh, Russia or it may look in some respects, one could actually make a comparison to Iran because you have the attorney general making statements about how postmodern post -modern universities are destroying religion. These statements, which would be literal and serious in a place like Iran, um, and the uh, struggle for power with very few rules, which would remind you of uh, weak democracies in many parts of the world. Uh, in America, they are, in a way, um, narrative tricks, as I argue in my recent piece. Um, they, I don't think they should be interpreted literally. Uh, and it's been a big mistake, people looking at Trump, to interpret Trump literally. When he says the press are the enemies of the people, yes, I can understand why people are disturbed by this. But I would also insist that we cannot read that in the same way that we would read it if, uh, um, you know, a, a, a dictator in the past or in the present in some other country said something like that. I think the comparison to Stalin misses the point, uh, the point of American irony. 
the point that nothing is taken very seriously, which is uh, irritating uh, to Europeans uh, and perhaps to others. I, I wonder how Indians look at Trump. I, I, I've seen a bit of reactions and it's mixed, but uh, there's also a lot of uh, uh, following of Trump in India. But uh, irritating to Europeans, this uh, um, American uh, ability uh, and talent not to take things too seriously. And we have to take that into account when we look at today's America. Uh, I think the basic mistake of many commentators is to take literally what has to be taken uh, ironically. Yeah, well, actually, I mean, we can go into that entire argument about American culture, American uh, education system, their sense of uh, self-belief, perhaps, which does not make allowances for uh, doubt. But before we go there, um, you argue also in your uh, excellent piece, by the way, in New York Times, you argued, I've saved it, I reread it, that um, this creation of hyper-reality, something over and above reality, right. um, which um, has won him many followers, really, because it opens the ground for being politically incorrect, so to speak or uh, thinking, um, uh, articulating what others may just be thinking and which you can't express in polite company, uh, is something that he has unleashed right. in that sense. Isn't it? I mean, uh, isn't he kind of, he has come to symbolize and articulate those aspirations and those ideas? Mm -hmm. Well, in the book, I try to trace it back in time, and I think one can find um, previous instances. But, uh, you know, Ronald Reagan, in, in, in some respects, anticipated many of the things we're talking about today. Uh, but I think you're right that Trump brings them to a, a point, to an extreme, where it's no longer possible to contextualize it. Uh, there's been a break in American politics. Now, the question I find interesting is, what is Trump really about? Is he about a return to the past and to the authority of uh, political power, but perhaps also tradition uh, of a certain understanding of America as fundamentally uh, Christian and fundamentally white? Is he a figure of authority? Uh, or is he actually a, a more postmodern image of America, uh, freed from every restriction, living in fantasy, living in a kind of fantasy life of a pure uh, uh, wish uh, and uh, unlimited desire? In my book, I argue the latter. And I was very interested to see, and uh, your, your readers and viewers uh, may want to look at this as well. Yesterday came out an interview uh, by Jeffrey Goldberg of The Atlantic magazine with Barack Obama, a very interesting interview uh, in, all, in all respects. But when they discuss Trump, this issue comes up. Uh, and Obama at first uh, is puzzled and using the kind of sarcasm that he's become very good at. Um, in his book, uh, he uh, directs this sarcasm against uh, many figures, including uh, famously an Indian politician, but in this case, talking about uh, 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 Donald Trump, uh, he, he sort of mocks him by saying, is this really the figure of authoritarianism that we were expecting? Um, is this the figure of manliness, uh, of uh, quiet self-assurance? Is this Gary Cooper or John Wayne? No, it's exactly the opposite, Obama says. He's someone who's always talking about himself. He's always, something, he's always whining about something, complaining about something. He's actually the very opposite of John Wayne. And I think that's interesting because um, Donald Trump is not a figure of authority, and that's not what he promises. Later on in the interview, Obama gets, goes back to this question, uh, and he, I think he's, he's, he's closer to the truth at that point because he compares Trump to a rapper and actually explains his appeal to uh, a number of famous uh, rappers, famous black musicians have been attract by, attracted by Trump because what Trump has symbolized is this image of fantasy life that was projected in The Apprentice, that you can have everything, that you can fulfill all your wishes, that you can live almost as if you are inside your own dreams, your own fantasies. I think that's what Trump symbolizes, not a kind of European authority figure from the 30s, but something much more from American popular culture, the movies, fantasy, television. 
that's relevant because in the end, uh, I think these instincts that Trump represents, the pursuit of fantasy, are going to remain in American politics and we're going to see them come back very quickly. It's just that the Trumpian fantasy collapsed under its own weight, but also importantly under the weight of, of the pandemic. Uh, I have no doubts that Trump would have won the election uh, if the pandemic hadn't happened. Just look at the numbers. Uh, uh, this hasn't been talked a lot, perhaps because it's not a, a pleasant fact to consider for many people, but if Trump had flipped only 20 to 23,000 votes in three states, Wisconsin, Arizona, and Georgia, he would have won the election. Just 22,000. Now, it's impossible to believe that without the pandemic, uh, he wouldn't have gotten those uh, 22,000 votes. Well, in fact, the pandemic may have actually brought out Democratic uh, Democrat votes uh, because they were the ones who were sending it out. There was a lot of lobbying. But how do you think this next few weeks will shape up and how will it end on the 20th of January? Oh, well, I'm, I'm sure that, that Trump will have to come to terms with this defeat. Um, he's, he's still trying. I think probably to the extent that he has a game plan, because I think a lot of this has to do with, with his own ego and coming to terms with defeat. But to the extent that he has an, a, a game plan, I think keeping this idea of electoral fraud in the air and in the, in the bloodstream of American politics helps him stay relevant, helps him uh, come back, helps him stay as a possible candidate for 2024. And if not a candidate himself, then the kingmaker who can decide who the candidate will be. And it's been striking and disturbing for those who hope to get rid of Trump entirely, that everyone in the Republican Party is moving very cautiously, not distancing themselves from Trump, uh, at the very least because they know that he continues to have overwhelming support in, in the Republican base. Uh, and so they will have to be on good terms with him if they want, if they want to be viable candidates in 2024, uh, Ted Cruz, um, uh, for example, or obviously Pompeo and, and others. So I don't think uh, Trump is finished as an important political figure. Uh, and I actually think uh, if I had to make a bet, uh, I, I would think he may announce a candidacy for 2024 relatively quickly. Who knows, perhaps in December. He might take it back later depending on what happens with legal cases against him, what happens with his health, uh, many other things. He may take it back in, in 2022. But in order to become relevant, I think he needs that, the idea that he can be a candidate again. And he's probably might be interested in creating some kind of media operation or perhaps even a, a, a full-fledged television channel. So if you have Trump as a possible candidate for 2024 and running a, an important media operation, with many of his supporters fully committed to the idea that he actually never lost, uh, and so he is not a loser, uh, I think he's going to remain an important uh, political figure. Um, Joe Biden said yesterday that he's not interested in pursuing um, a, a, a kind of a legal um, crusade uh, against Trump and, and his followers, that he wants to move on. Uh, and that's been perplexing to many people. Um, but it would also help help Trump if um, if the feeling in the administration and sort of the message being com communicated to the Justice Department is that uh, uh, Trump should not be persecuted for uh, tax offenses and others. Uh, then he's going to be in a strong position. But whether he has any chance this time around, no, he doesn't. And we're going to have President Biden on January 20th. Uh, that That is a certainty. Um, so if he, if he starts this media operation and announces sooner than later, much before the season, as it were, right, right. then um, he'll remain in play not only to his supporters, not only as a viable, serious candidate, but he'll put everyone else in this party on the defensive, clearly. I mean, they'll, they'll immediately say, oh, we've got to kind of keep this man amused and happy and let's take it by, because they have not shown any resistance to him so far. That's right. So people like Ted Cruz and Marco Rubio, uh, who obviously have a kind of personal contempt for Trump, that personal contempt was obvious in 2015 before Trump became the nominee and then the president. So we know that's, that's how they feel in their hearts. But I think what they're calculating is if you come out now and say the Republican Party has to move beyond Trump, which would be a 
very reasonable thing to say. Uh, he lost the election. He's been divisive. Uh, the party should move beyond it. But no one is saying this, and I doubt they will, uh, because they know that this would uh, probably uh, uh, make them inviable as candidates uh, in 2024, Rubio or Cruz or others. Uh, so Trump is still going to be around. Um, he's still going to be tweeting. Um, we'll see. I mean, it's, I mean, there could be arguments on both sides, whether the kind of interest from the public uh, is going to stay or whether people will 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 not regard trump as seriously when it doesn't have the apparatus of power when it, when it doesn't have air force one when it doesn't have the props uh when it doesn't have the white house and, and so on and so forth um so it's still an open question but clearly uh, no one is willing to break with him could be trump in 2024 it could be his um uh, someone from his family i i, I would bet on, on ivanka more than than one of the boys. Uh, so that's entirely possible as well. And maybe that might be his plan, by the way. Uh, he could announce and then later, um, when the season comes, as you said, uh, he, would, he would suddenly explain that uh, Ivanka is going to take his place or, you know, I think we, st- we have to be prepared for a lot more uh, uh, soap operas from, from Trump and the Trump family in the coming years. Uh, if, you found, if you found them intolerable, you, you have to embrace yourself for more of it. <laughs> but uh, is it possible that there could be a Trump-like figure, somebody who is also a better politician, a better executive, a better manager, more consistent with um, uh, her or his policies, somebody who says that um, uh, I take a lot of ideas from the playbook, uh, the populism, et cetera, et cetera, but I reject and because the Republican Party sees itself as the party of governance, as a party of, um, you know, of course, the usual tax cuts and anti-immigration and all that kind of thing. But uh, runs with his form and some, you know, playbook, as I said, but is a far, far more astute, uh, better manager. Yes, that's been a very uh, a, a very popular opinion in the last few weeks uh, by many commentators. I wrote my piece actually against this because I think Trumpism is about the reality television, is about the drama, is about the spectacle. I don't think it's about a policy position, anti-immigration, economically populist. Uh, you know, he threw some signals in that direction. He never really pursued them very strongly. He deported fewer people than Obama did in his second term. Um, so I don't think the crucial issue here, people were attracted by this idea of a boundless freedom. You could be politically incorrect. You could even um, not be uh, good mannered in public. That was kind of a moment of liberation to see a politician speak his mind and, and say all kinds of crazy stuff. I think this is what defined Trumpism. And so if you get a figure that is, again, the figure of authority, the John Wayne that Obama was talking about, talking about religion, family values, uh, strongly, violently, aggressively anti-immigration and so on, I just don't think there's appetite in American society for this. It's not like Trump had the right ideas and he was incompetent. I think people were attracted, fundamentally attracted by his unseriousness paradoxically, as this may sound. And if you had a figure, even a Ted Cruz um, uh, or a Tom Cotton, the senator, that tried to use a kind of a conservative or even reactionary policy platform, this would be scary for many Americans. Um, they, wouldn't, they wouldn't really trust it. I don't think the future in America belongs to these kind of figures. The future in America be, belongs to, to the new Trumps, who, by the way, could be on the left. Um, Ocasio-Cortez, uh, the way she builds narratives and stories, uh, there's something Trumpian about her. Um, there was a line in my book where I said there was something about uh, Ocasio-Cortez that was Trumpian, and uh, not everyone liked that line before it was published, and I removed it, but I, uh, I, I still think that's the case. Um, and we have other figures on the left, certainly the woke left, these protests in, in Portland and Seattle, the element of spectacle of play acting is there very strongly. I think the future in America belongs to this, not to sort of serious figures of authority. So I don't believe that we're going to have that, that we're going to have a supremely competent authoritarian uh, new Trump. Um, Don't don't think there's appetite for this in America. 
So uh, to quote a cliche, it's already become a cliche in a few weeks. Trump will go, but Trumpism will remain. Right. Then the debate going on is what do we understand by Trumpism? Because obviously Trump was uh, uh, such a, a, a figure of chaos, disorder, including mental uh, confusion. Uh, I think it's fair to say that that he never really developed the doctrine. I mean, the idea of a Trump doctrine seems a contradiction in terms. So when we say Trumpism, there's a, an effort that has to be made to actually spell out what it means. For me, uh, you know, that's the, the whole uh, thesis of my book. Trumpism is this element of fantasy, uh, of play acting, um, of reality television applied to everything. Uh, and if we define Trumpism in that way, I think it's now so... Uh, the, the defining element of American politics and American society that is really truly everywhere, uh, from the media to the social media to technology uh, to even religion, as I argue in the book, which has also become uh, a form of uh, uh, reality television in many respects. But that's been ongoing. Uh, I remember seeing a uh, a lady coming out of the mass uh, during the the first wave of COVID. Uh, back in April, uh, and a reporter uh, asked her, uh, aren't you afraid of, of being infected? And she, she said, I'm not afraid of being infected because I'm covered in the blood of Christ. Uh, and, and, and this sentence, uh, should, again, should not be taken literally. Um, this this uh, lady on the television show is not an aspiring theocrat. Uh, there's an element, even in the way Americans approach religion, that should not be taken literally. Uh, the uh, the expression is much more extreme than the underlying reality. So I think this element of, of play acting, of fantasy, is now uh, so pervasive in American society uh, that it's not going to go away. Uh, and Trump is going to remain an, an inspiration for many politicians. Um, the time of, um, of the serious composed uh, American president, I think, is essentially in the past, even if Joe Biden is going to try to recover a bit of that. But many of the younger politicians now, um, one thing that that you've been seeing argued by young politicians in America is they looked at Trump and they actually were fascinated by the way in which he was able to get during the 2016 campaign, two or three billion dollars worth of free uh, television coverage through his manipulation of uh, media interest and attention. Uh, and so in American politics now is either you have three billion of your own money or you have to create a spectacle around you. Uh, so this is not going to go away. And if by Trumpism we, we understand this, I think it's, uh, it's here to stay. Yeah, it's fascinating you just uh, mentioned uh, Ocasio-Cortez because uh, you mentioned her in your book. Uh, there is a bit... And at one place, you said that the U.S. will own memes of production. And in fact, this whole idea of meme production or the whole idea of tweeting, the whole idea of using social media platforms, uh, not just for organizing, but to present an image. It's just like uh, the Kennedy won because it was the first TV election. So the, we are seeing, and actually, as you probably know, we have seen that in India too, using the internet, um, which has since got more and more and more. Though, of course, it helps to also have control of the conventional media. Um, is this now becoming a global kind of phenomenon? In some respects, yes. I think it takes a different and more extreme form in America. Um, I don't quite see that. Uh, let me say, in, in Europe, the contrast has been very vivid. Uh, let us take the example of COVID. If you open a newspaper in Europe right now, or um, um, really any time since March, it reads quite a bit like a medicine journal. Uh, there's lots of graphs, explanations of how vaccines work, uh, lots of tables, numbers, figures. Uh, and the debate in America has been completely different. Uh, it has uh, uh, incorporated, assimilated the virus into these fantastical stories, you know. At, back in the summer and for a few weeks, uh, it was more important in the American debate to decide what to call the virus whether you're going to call it uh, Wuhan virus or China virus or COVID 19. Um, or SARS-2, to be completely rigorous. It was more important to decide on the name, as if you are a group of script writers around a table trying to come up with, with the names for the characters. 
than it was to actually fight the virus. I think it was a very illustrative moment of uh, how American culture has become disconnected from reality. So I do think this is much more extreme in America. The contrast with Europe is very vivid, and it's also one of the ideas in my book to actually call attention to the fact that we no longer communicate very well between the two sides of the Atlantic. And we had a recent polemic between President Macron of France and the New York Times is a good example of this. India, uh, unfortunately, I don't know well, and I also know better than to uh, come on, on an Indian show and start to offer many opinions about very hot political issues, like how to interpret BJP's use of social media. Uh, I, it's very intense, uh, but uh, I, I do feel, um, uh, if I'm on Twitter, for example, then Indian Twitter and American Twitter are, are different fundamentally. Uh, Indian Twitter seems to me uh, much more genuine, much more passionate, uh, that people genuinely are fighting for an image of Indian society and how to transform Indian society. So that seems to me fundamentally different from the uh, the pure element of spectacle that we see in America. There are obviously common common elements. but the way, let us say, Twitter and Facebook has been assimilated and incorporated in Europe, uh, in, uh, in India, and, and then how the Chinese versions also have been used is very different. Uh, we shouldn't assume that these things mean the same in different parts of the world. It's a big part of my work over the past few years in my books to try to dig up these uh, um, profound differences um, between what I call civilizational universes. And it, uh, you know, one of the frustrating things is that people tend to assume that they can interpret uh, things that are superficially the same in the same way, uh, where in fact it takes a lot of effort. You know, I was telling before this interview that if I wanted to write a book on India, it would take an enormous effort to, um, uh, let us say, disconnect from my priors that I would bring to India and, and, and start to understand Indian society from within. I, I, f- I firmly believe in that. So I'm always very resistant to, I'm much more interested in finding differences than in finding similarities. The similarities are easy, but I, I feel that the differences are, are just as important. One of your books talks about the creation of Eurasia, a sort of coming together of Europe and Asia in the future. What exactly do you mean by that? The book is um, an attempt to think of Eurasia as an integrated space, um, but with competition, with flows of influence, with flows of power. So not, an inter- not a politically or culturally integrated block, but uh, going back, let us say, to the times before modern European uh, empires, uh, where there was flows in both directions. Um, the world of, let us say, the medieval Eurasia with uh, with the Mongols, um, with, um, uh, with, with these intense networks of trade, um, but never with political integration because the Eurasia was composed of very different and, and very powerful blocks, but all in a certain way at the same level. What I argue in the book is that what Europeans introduced, the idea that European society was more advanced and Asian society was catching up, this idea has now collapsed and we have to think of Eurasia as existing on the same level. Uh, but, uh, of course, competition is, is going to be a big part of this. The main idea of that book is actually that uh, Eurasia is the big question of the future. What shape will it take? I think some kind of understanding between the main blocks is one possibility. Uh, intense competition is another. Um, they could be uh, broken apart. Uh, we can have different alliances and configurations. If you ask me about India... Well, I think India is one of the most interesting cases. Uh, how, and, and you know, I see an intense debate in India right now. What should be India's place in Eurasia? Uh, should it s- sort of reinvigorate its alliance with Russia from the old Cold War days? Uh, should it uh, break definitively with, with China and cut all bridges? Uh, should it try to find some kind of, of, of uh, closer relationship with Europe, which never seems to work somehow? Uh, should it try to build uh, a, a strong alliance with Japan, which has been one of the most interesting stories of the last uh, 10 years? Uh, so you see that the question is, how are all these pieces in Eurasia going to fit together? They're all moving 
And it's essentially a new world because that old very simple framework of there is Europe allied with the United States, this is the West, and then there's Asia as a, as a whole, which is somehow behind in the historical process and will never really catch up, but it's always aspiring to catch up. This model has collapsed completely. Uh, and we now have uh, uh, to find a, a new way. So the, the Eurasia is more like a, an enigma, a question in my book than an answer is what will happen to this block, which is now in accelerated movement and transformation and all the main pieces are trying to, to see where they fit. Same thing in Europe, you know, Europe can't quite make up its mind how to do this. Uh, is it gonna be an independent autonomous bloc? Is it gonna be America's um, bridgehead in Eurasia? Uh, is it going to be in a cold war with Russia or actually will it move closer to Russia in order to face the Chinese threat? Does it try to build a bridge with Japan far away as it is? Does it try it with India? So these are the questions that I'm on this chessboard that I'm, I'm trying to discuss in the book. Um, but clearly now with a number of cultural civilizational spaces that are very self-confident uh, and no longer that very simple framework of the West as the model and everyone else trying to imitate it in its own way. Thank you. I just have one last question and that's again, uh, the conclusion of your last book is that uh, you've said uh, America has to pick itself up and become a world leader again with, uh, with other countries rising, China specifically, but Russia is always a power uh, you know, Europe uh, together uh, counts for something. India is emerging. Can America really assume that role anymore? Or is it now going to become one more interesting, very, very economically advanced, technologically way ahead of everybody, a lot of investment power. Uh, the dollar still stands strong, but not really the untrammeled global leader. That's right. So there was a moment after 1989 where America almost, and this was taken seriously by many people, almost became a world government, uh, uh, a kind of a flexible, distant, uh, removed government in the sense that he was not involved in everything, but he had an opinion about everything. He was heard about everything and he had enough power to influence the outcome if necessary. So a kind of papacy, let us say, of medieval Europe, uh, um, you know, it was not going to be deciding every single issue, but it was going to be heard on, on, on every important issue. Uh, and we have to realize that in just 30 years, my lifetime, this idea has completely collapsed, right? It's an enormous change. Maybe we don't see it because we go from year to year, but if we think back to how things were considered in 1991, the change has been dramatic. Now, the United States has become... Um, the most powerful country in the world, but a country among others. And certainly this idea of a world American government, which by the way, was trying to push the whole world in the direction of American society. The whole world was supposed to converge with some American model. History had ended. History had ended. That's right. That's right. Fukuyama's vision, of course. Uh, and I think it's, it's, it's completely gone. No one takes this seriously anymore. And there are even many people who took it seriously in 1989 and now we'll say that they never did, but they did, if you, if you see those writings. So now what I suggest in the book is, since America is still uh, on most metrics of power, the most powerful country in the world, with this stature much reduced, remember that in 1950, America was responsible for half of the world's GDP. That's now down to 20% and China is 17. Uh, but still, you know, it's the largest economy in the world and it has a role to play because this world I just described answering the previous question of many different civilizations that are self-confident that are competing is the world calling for some kind of empire um, not a world government but uh, a balancer someone that can try to rebalance the structure when it's uh, uh, being destabilized and I think that's a role the United States could play better than anyone else could play better than China in my opinion and it could play better than the United Nations because the United Nations simply does not even dream about that role anymore. So the United States could do that, but many changes would be necessary in American political culture and foreign policy culture. You'd have to abandon this idea of uh, taking the American model all over the world. You'd have to go back to a much more sober balance of power idea 
where the United States would not be interested in transforming China. Because the idea sounds crazy to someone like me who knows a bit about China, but it would be interested in containing, balancing Chinese power, particularly when Chinese power has become very disruptive and an element of disorder and instability, which it has become in Asia, I think. And I think many Indians would agree with me, but other parts of Asia. So at this point where China has become an element of um, uh, instability, everyone in Beijing would, would start screaming if they, if they heard this, but I think uh, uh, the facts speak for themselves. Uh, the role that the United States should play, and I think it was a role that would be welcomed in Asia as opposed to other roles, would be to balance Chinese power, to offer an alternative in many places, uh, to slow down China's rise. Uh, again, we shouldn't be against China's rise, but when it is too fast and when it's becoming an element of instability and, and disorder uh, in many parts of the world, particularly in Asia, there's a role for a balancer. And I try to argue in the book that if we could really bury the idea of neoconservatism, this almost religious idea of neoconservatism, and have a more distant, more ironic, more culturally curious United States, uh, whose first reaction, let us say, when it looks at India would not be to say, you shouldn't do A, B, C, D, uh, because this is not proper, uh, but it would, should look at India as potentially an important element in, in the new balance of power. And so this approach, I think, would be uh, the best that the United States could do for world politics and also the best hope for, for American power. Uh, but it, it involves a significant change, uh, which I think is happening, but very slowly. I think President Biden, uh, in his call with the Indian Prime Minister, said something on the lines of we want to work with India on economic security and um, climate change, etc. So perhaps uh, some some change in tone, some say, change in approach. Uh, I suppose India has to uh, take a step forward also because, like many other countries, most other countries, we may have still have uh, um, you know old cultural habits. Uh, institutional memories which are locking us into a certain kind of approach. So, um, so would you say that uh, all in all, if you saw something so radical as a potential world government in the 80s and 90s to now, do you see the next few years also emerging or throwing up all kinds of interesting um, scenarios? How do you see them? I, I think change is actually happening. We're just not very good at noticing it. Uh, if we could be transported back to 10 or 15 years ago, uh, we would be more aware of how change is happening very fast. Uh, the example you, you gave is a very good one. Let's say 10 years ago, if you're discussing technology and data, the approach in Europe and the US would be, we have a Western bloc uh, that represents the right values about technology and about data protection. And now we have to export this all over the world. And if Europe and the US were talking with India, we would probably be lecturing you about how you don't care as much about data protection. This was still the case uh, seven years ago when I was in government. Now, if you look, for example, I have a couple of articles that came out in Foreign Affairs, this latest issue, the approach is completely different. The approach now is we have to build an alliance that should include Israel, India, uh, Japan, um, and that should be primarily aimed at balancing China's growing dominance in technology. So rather than being, uh, then lecturing the rest of the world how to do things, you're actually trying to build networks that are fundamentally about balancing power, much less ideological, much more practical, and much more comfortable with cultural diversity. You wouldn't be as obsessed about um, teaching uh, Indian authorities how to, how to deal with technology and how to deal with data. So the change has been dramatic, uh, just that it's because it is continuous, uh, we sometimes adapt to it and, and, and don't, are not entirely aware that it is happening. But I think these kinds of changes have been truly, truly dramatic, and in Europe as well. Ten years ago, we thought the whole world was going to become like the European Union. Now we're just concerned about uh, limiting the impact of the rest of the world on Europe. It's a dramatic, dramatic change. Thank you, uh, Bruno Masaj. Uh, that was a really comprehensive look at not just the states, but uh, the world. It comes from your years of experience as a politician and as a 
thinker and a writer. Uh, this was a really excellent interview. Thank you very much on behalf of The Wire and its viewers. It's been a great pleasure and uh, all best wishes for The Wire, one of my uh, five favorite media outlets in the world today, for sure. Thank you. That was very nice. To receive instant updates on all videos from The Wire, click the subscribe button and hit the bell icon. Pay to support independent journalism. Click the link in the description and choose the amount you want to pay.